Protection from Abuse Proceedings in the Main Court System Hello, I'm a judge of the Maine District Court, which handles protection from abuse cases. This video is for people who are involved in protection from abuse cases, either as plaintiffs, meaning the person who is claiming to have been abused, or as defendants, meaning the person who was accused of committing abuse. The plaintiff is the person claiming abuse. The defendant is the person accused of abusing the plaintiff. Filing a complaint with the court. A protection from abuse case starts when the plaintiff files a complaint with the court. The complaint is the written statement describing how the plaintiff claims to have been abused by the defendant and outlining what the plaintiff is asking the court to do. In most counties, the plaintiff has to come to the courthouse to file a complaint. First steps. Get a complaint form from your local district court or online at www.ptla.org. Then fill out the forms and file the complaint with the court. Requirements for bringing a protection from abuse case to court. There are two basic requirements for a protection from abuse case. First, the plaintiff and the defendant must be what the law refers to as family or household members. This means generally that the parties to a protection from abuse case must be married or related by blood or have had a sexual relationship. If there has not been that kind of relationship, the plaintiff in the case may still be entitled to a protection order, but it may need to be what is called a protection from harassment order. Protection from harassment cases are the other kind of protection cases available under main law. Protection from harassment cases are generally for neighbors, coworkers, and other people who have had a problem, but who are not related by blood or marriage or through some other type of relationship. You can check with the clerk if you're not sure which type of case you should be pursuing. The other basic requirement in a protection from abuse case is that the plaintiff must have been abused by the defendant. The law defines abuse to mean any one or more of the following kinds of conduct. Assaulting someone so as to cause injury or offensive physical contact. Threatening someone in a way that would put that person in reasonable fear of bodily harm. Putting someone in reasonable fear of bodily harm through some course of conduct. Stalking someone to the point that they are in reasonable fear of bodily harm. Forcing someone to do something against their will or preventing them from doing something that they have the right to do. That is not a complete list, but it does cover the kinds of abuse that most often cause people to come to court asking for orders of protection against abuse. Whether someone's actions add up to abuse or not is sometimes a judgment call. Not every heated argument or threat justifies a protection order, but it is also clear that a person does not have to wait until they are hurt before coming to court asking for protection. One way to assess the situation is to ask whether the defendant's actions and statements either have caused physical injury or would cause the reasonable person to be in fear of physical injury. You do not have to wait until you are hurt to ask the court for protection. The Protection from Abuse Complaint, Part 1 The Protection from Abuse Complaint is the court document in which the plaintiff tells the court what the case is about and tells the court what the plaintiff is asking the court to do. If you're the plaintiff, you should fill out the complaint carefully because it is under oath that you may be questioned later about what the complaint says. The first part of the complaint asks for information about you and the defendant. If you're concerned about the defendant knowing where you live, you can request that your address be kept confidential. If you and the defendant have had one or more children together and those children are less than 18 years old, there's a place in the complaint for you to list the names and birth dates of the children. There's also a space for you to describe any court orders now in effect regarding the children, such as a divorce judgment, a parental rights and responsibilities complaint, 
or a Department of Human Services Child Protective Order. If you can, you should provide the court with a copy of those other court orders. Part 1 of the complaint form contains information about the plaintiff and the defendant. It lists the names and birth dates of any minor children the plaintiff and the defendant have had together, and describes any current court orders involving the children. The Protection from Abuse Complaint, Part 2. The next section of the complaint asks the plaintiff to describe what it is that the plaintiff is saying the defendant has done that constitutes abuse. So the plaintiff should write down every incident, action, or statement that the plaintiff expects to bring up later in court. If you leave out something that's important, you may not be allowed to bring it up later. Part 2 of the complaint form presents the case against the defendant. It describes each incident in detail and it lists everything you expect to bring up in court. The Protection from Abuse Complaint, Part 3 The last section of the complaint asks the plaintiff to spell out what it is that uh, you're asking the court to do. Now, the court protection that's available includes an order directing the defendant to stay away from you and your home and your workplace, awarding you temporary possession of the residence, giving you temporary exclusive parental rights and responsibilities over any children that you and the defendant have had together, and ordering child support, temporary spousal support, money damages, and other kinds of relief. Beside the complaint, you will be asked to fill out an information sheet that provides information on the defendant including any involvement by the defendant with firearms. Be as specific as you can on the information sheet because it will help the police and other law enforcement agencies locate the defendant and deal with any firearms issues that are raised by the information you provide. Part 3 of the complaint form specifies, in detail, what the plaintiff is asking the court to do. You will be asked to fill out an information sheet on the defendant. This will be used to find the defendant in order to serve the court papers. Temporary Orders of Protection The plaintiff also has the right to request what is called a temporary order of protection covering the time period between the day the complaint is filed in the court and the day that this case is scheduled to be heard in the court. Temporary orders can be granted immediately by the judge if the complaint shows that the plaintiff is at immediate risk of harm from the defendant. Temporary orders can prohibit the defendant from contacting the plaintiff or going to the plaintiff's home or workplace, as well as harassing or following the plaintiff. A temporary order can also award temporary parental rights to one parent only, but it can also award visitation. Temporary orders normally can, cannot be used to get back property such as car keys and bank accounts, but those items can be covered in a permanent or final order of protection. If you're asking for a temporary order, you may wish to wait at the courthouse while the judge is reviewing your complaint. In case the judge has any questions about the complaint or needs additional information, if the judge is considering denying a request for a temporary order, the judge must first meet with the plaintiff. If a temporary order is denied, you have a right to decide whether or not to proceed with the case any further. If a temporary order is granted, it does not take effect until the defendant is served or provided with a copy of the temporary order or is at least notified of what is in the temporary order protection. A temporary order of protection can be granted immediately if the complaint shows that the plaintiff is at immediate risk of harm by the defendant. Service of Papers on the Defendant In order for the case to proceed, the defendant must be provided or served with a copy of the complaint, any temporary order of protection that has been granted, and also the summons that states when the case will be heard in the court. Service of these papers is usually done by a law enforcement officer handing the defendant 
a copy of the court papers. You may wish to contact the police department or sheriff's office responsible for serving the papers to check on the status of the defendant being served in case the agency needs further information on how to locate the defendant. If you are a defendant and you have been served. If you are a defendant, the law requires that you be notified of the court case and provided with a copy of the complaint and any other documents the plaintiff has filed with the court. You will be provided with a summons that lists the date, time, and courthouse where the plaintiff's case will be heard. If the court has issued a temporary order of protection, you are required to obey it as soon as it is served on you by a law enforcement officer or as soon as you are notified of the requirements of the order, whichever comes first. Violating a temporary order is a criminal offense for which the violator can be arrested and prosecuted. If you have been named as a defendant, you will receive a copy of the complaint. You will receive a summons listing the date, time, and courthouse where the plaintiff's case will be heard. You must obey the requirements of any temporary court orders as soon as you are notified of them or are served papers by law enforcement. You may use an attorney in court. Whether you are a plaintiff or a defendant, you have a right to the assistance of an attorney in a protection from abuse case throughout the time the case is pending in the court, although you're not required to have an attorney. The court does not provide court-appointed attorneys in this type of case, so you will need to locate an attorney yourself. For low-income people who are plaintiffs in protection from abuse cases, free legal assistance is available from organizations such as Pine Tree Legal Assistance. The Domestic Violence Support and Advocacy Organization in your area can also give you the names of attorneys if you're a plaintiff. Those organizations also have advocates who are not attorneys, but who are knowledgeable about protection from abuse cases and who can come to court with the plaintiff to provide support. In some courts, organizations that provide legal services or non-legal forms of support are present every week when protection from abuse cases are scheduled for hearing. If you are a defendant in a protection from abuse case, you have the same rights as a plaintiff to legal assistance. If you don't know where to look, you can contact the Maine State Bar Association Law Re Lawyer Referral Service for information about finding an attorney. Whether you're a plaintiff or a defendant, if you know that you're going to want an attorney to assist you in the court, you shouldn't wait until the court day to find an attorney. If you wait, the judge may not be willing to postpone the case any further to allow you to find an attorney. Free legal assistance is available for low-income plaintiffs. Some resources are Pine Tree Legal Assistance, the Volunteer Lawyers Project, and the Maine Coalition to End Domestic Violence. If you are a defendant, the Maine Lawyer Referral Service is a resource for locating an attorney. The court hearing date and requests for postponement. The next step in the court process is the court hearing date. If the plaintiff wants the case to proceed, the plaintiff must be at court on the day and time the case is scheduled for hearing. Likewise, if the defendant wants to participate in the court process, or to contest the case, or at least to speak to the judge about the case, even if the defendant isn't contesting the case, then the defendant must also be at court on the day and time set for hearing. If for some reason a plaintiff or a defendant cannot be at court on the day the case is set for hearing, you must let the court know ahead of time, if possible, by contacting the clerk's office. It's best to write a letter to the court clerk explaining why you cannot be at court and requesting that the case be postponed. However, you should at least make a telephone call if there is a time to mail a letter. You should not contact the other person involved in the case directly about this. The court clerk will take care of contacting the other person. Based on the information that you submit and based also on the other person's response to your request, the judge will decide whether to postpone the court hearing or not. 
If you don't appear at court on the day of your hearing, and if you haven't contacted the court ahead of time to let the court know, it's likely that your case will be dismissed if you're the plaintiff, or if you're the defendant, it's likely that a court order will be granted to the plaintiff without her being there. If you're the defendant and you've been served with court papers just a short time before the court hearing day, you can ask the court for additional time to prepare your case. However, you should still come to court on the hearing day and make that request to the judge, and the judge can decide whether or not to postpone the case as you're requesting. If there's been a temporary order of protection issued in the case, that temporary order will continue in effect until the next time your case comes back to court. The plaintiff must be in court at the scheduled date and time in order for the case to proceed. The defendant must be in court at the scheduled time if he or she wants to contest the case. If you cannot make the scheduled court date, you must contact the court clerk's office as soon as possible and explain why you cannot be there. Preparing for your court hearing On the day that your case is scheduled for hearing, you should come ready to have a trial if a trial is needed in your case. If you have not already arranged to have an attorney represent you, you should come prepared to represent yourself if necessary. You should bring with you any witnesses and evidence that you're asking the court to consider, such as photographs, documents, tape recordings, and other forms of evidence. In deciding what evidence to present, the plaintiff and the defendant should keep in mind the limitation on what evidence the court can consider. There are three major requirements. First, evidence must be relevant or have a bearing to the issues presented in the case. This means generally, as far as abuse is concerned, that the evidence must focus on what the plaintiff has written down in the complaint. If there is evidence presented beyond what is written down in the complaint, the defendant can object on the ground that it is beyond the scope of the issues in the case. The second requirement is that generally speaking, hearsay evidence or secondhand information is not allowed. And this means that uh, the witnesses in the case should generally have seen or heard what it is that they are planning to testify about. The third limitation on what type of evidence can be presented is that evidence should not be repetitive. It's not necessary to present multiple witnesses to establish a particular point. You're not required to have witnesses beside yourself. You yourself can be your own witness and everything you have to say is considered evidence. The judge will listen to your description of what has happened in the case and after you've finished uh, presenting what it is you're asking the court to consider, the other party has a right to ask you questions and to ask questions of any other witnesses you call. Remember, on the date your case is scheduled for hearing, you must be ready to present your case and to present evidence if necessary. Keep the following points in mind as you prepare for your hearing. Evidence should focus on what the plaintiff has written in the complaint. Hearsay or second-hand evidence is generally not allowed in court. Your evidence should not be repetitive. You are not required to present witnesses besides yourself. You must be ready to present your case on the day of the hearing. A court order issued by agreement. The judge in your case may ask you whether you're the plaintiff or the defendant, whether you're willing to consider the possibility of a court order issued by agreement without a trial. And if you say yes in response to that question, all you're saying is that you're willing to consider the possibility. There should be no direct discussion between the plaintiff and the defendant about the possibility of agreeing upon a court order. Sometimes there are temporary orders of protection in effect that make it a crime for the defendant to have any contact with the plaintiff. But even when there is no court order of protection in effect, to assure that both parties in the case are making their own voluntary decisions about what to do, the judge uh, may direct the parties not to have any contact. Instead, the judge will speak to the parties directly about the possibility of an agreement, or if there's a lawyer involved in the case, 
where there's a representative of a domestic violence organization assisting the plaintiff, that person can serve as a go-between uh, to help the parties explore the possibility of an order by agreement. An order by agreement can contain all of the same protection that a court order issued after a trial can have. And an order by agreement is subject to the same penalties for violation as an order issued after a trial. On the other hand, a court order issued by agreement usually does not contain any decision or finding that the defendant has committed abuse against the plaintiff. Instead of addressing the past and deciding what occurred in the past, an order by agreement looks simply to the future and can provide both parties with everything that an order of protection issued after a trial can provide. A court order issued by agreement does not require a trial. It can contain all the same protections as a court order issued after a trial, and does not have to contain a finding that the defendant has committed abuse. At the trial. If there is a trial needed in any case, the plaintiff always presents evidence first, followed by the defendant presenting evidence. The reason the plaintiff goes first is because the plaintiff has what is called the burden of proof in a protection for an abuse case. There are two basic things that the plaintiff must prove. First, the plaintiff must prove that the plaintiff and the defendant are family or household members. And this generally means that they must be related by blood or be married or related by marriage or have had a sexual relationship in the past. In addition to that, the plaintiff must always prove at a trial that the defendant has committed abuse against the plaintiff or against any children listed as plaintiffs in the case. The plaintiff must prove two things at the trial. First, that the defendant is or has been the plaintiff's blood relative, spouse or domestic partner, dating partner, housemate, stalker, or sexual assailant. Second, that the defendant has abused the plaintiff or children in the case. The plaintiff must show that it is more likely than not that the abuse happened. The plaintiff and the defendant each have a right to testify as witnesses on their own behalf, and they each have a right to call additional witnesses on their own behalf. Whether you're a plaintiff or defendant, you should come to court with a general idea of what it is you'd like to cover in your testimony. You should also come to court prepared to ask questions of your additional witnesses. You also have a right, whether you're a plaintiff or a defendant, to cross-examine or question the witnesses called by the other side, including the other party if that person testifies. The judge may exercise control over the questioning, both on direct examination and on cross-examination. The judge may require you to present your questions to the judge so that person can actually present the questions to the witness. To make the most of your day in court, come with a plan for your testimony. And come prepared with questions to ask your witnesses, and also for the witnesses called by the other side, if any. In cases involving children, the evidence that presented can cover not only the abuse that the plaintiff claims has occurred, but also evidence that will help the court make decisions about parental rights and responsibilities. So whether you're a plaintiff or a defendant in that type of case, you should be prepared to present evidence on the best interests of the children involved in the case to help the court make good decisions for the children. In cases involving children, be prepared to present evidence that will help the court make good decisions for the children. After both parties have presented all their evidence, the trial ends. The judge may make a decision on the spot or may take the case under advisement or delay making a decision until some later time. If the judge decides that the plaintiff has proved abuse, the judge will issue a court order of protection from abuse. On the other hand, if the judge decides the plaintiff has not proved abuse, then the case ends without any court order being issued. 
Either party has the right to appeal a court decision made over that party's objection. After the trial, the judge may rule on the case right away, or the judge may delay issuing a ruling until a later date. Either party has the right to appeal the court's decision.